I wish to recognize Ruling Elder Kenna Payne, moderator of the Mission Council for the adoption of the agenda. Good morning, Kenna. Good morning, moderator. Good morning to everybody. The agenda that's been proposed is on page one of your packet. The only minor change that I know of is the Mission Council will bring a piece of business that will require a vote, but it was, will be within our report. This agenda is coming from the Mission Council. I know of no other agendas, uh, no other amendments to it. So I move um, from, the commission, from the Council that this agenda be adopted, moderator. Okay. Thank you, Kenna. The recommendation is to approve the agenda. And since it comes from a, a, a Council, it, a second is not required. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to the motion? Okay, I declare we are ready to vote. I declare that the agenda is approved. Thank you all. Kenna, I believe we will see you again shortly. I call on teaching elder Fred Holbrook, interim general presbyter and stated clerk to give the stated clerk's report, which starts on page three of the packet. Good morning again, Fred. Thank you, moderator. Some of us are a bit more um, heighted than others, so I can come down this way or... Um, there we go, thank you. We've got a marvelous team working today, so thanks to everyone. Moderator, on page three and following, there will be uh, commission reports, four of them that you will see there, some other reports in, the, in, the, in my portion. But I now move the consent agenda, which can be found on page six of the packet. And I move that the Presbytery approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Fred. Is there a second? McCall, thank you. Second. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to the motion? Okay. Seeing no one uh, wish to speak to the motion, I declare we are ready to vote. So a poll has been released on Zoom. Okay. Seeing none, I declare that the motion carries. Um, moderator, that completes my report. Thank you, Fred. I call again on ruling elder Kenna Payne, moderator of the Mission Council to give its report. Hello again, Kenna. Hello again, moderator. Uh, Mission Council report starts on page seven of your packet. The first um, item of business this morning is to recognize the work among us of Deborah Rexroth, who left as a staff member in the fall and was unable to be with us in our February stated meeting. So it is my privilege as moderator of the Mission Council to lead the Presbytery in celebration and thanksgiving for the dedicated work of Deborah Rexroad, the former Associate for Stewardship and Evangelism. In her several years with the Presbytery, she provided information, guidance, resources, and Christian fellowship among all of us and our ministries. This morning, we have asked seven people from our midst to briefly reflect on her work with them. Moderator, I ask that those who are not commissioners at today's meeting, including Deborah, be given the privilege of the floor. Thank you. Privilege is granted. Thank you. Thank you, Kenna. Uh, Ayers Lohr and ruling elder from Providence Forge. Mr. Lohr, would you please start us off? Hi, I'm Ayers Lohr, and I'm a ruling elder from Providence Forge, and it is my honor to uh, talk for just a minute or two about Deborah. In my career with DuPont, my last stop was a plant near Charleston, West Virginia. When there, we lived in the town of Nitro, West Virginia, which is very near where Deborah and her husband raised their family. 
We shopped at the same Kroger. My wife and I worshiped at First Press in Charleston, across the street from she worked. A good friend of mine taught at the organic chemistry where she received her undergraduate degree. But Dr. Rex Road and I never met. I retired and my wife and I chose to settle here in the eastern part of uh, east of, of Richmond. Not long after Deborah joined the staff of the Presbytery, we did meet and we quickly discovered how much we had in common. She had assisted the Providence Forge Church, where I'm an elder, many, many times, and she has preached at the church several times. She was, of course, extremely helpful and very well received. For several years, I was responsible for stewardship at PFPC. She was incredibly helpful to me. But most and more important, she taught me the love and joy she displays and her serving our Lord. She is infectious. She has taught me that when we choose to be Christians, we choose to be stewards of God's kingdom. That is more than just a responsibility. It is also an honor and a joy. I plan to carry the honor and joy she taught me in my life for the rest of my life. And I will endeavor to display it always. Thank you, Dr. Retro. Thank you, Deborah, very much. I very I give you my very best and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lohr. And now we'll move on to Barbara Espy, who is a member of the staff of the Presbyterian. Hi, I'm Barbara Espy, Associate for Administration at the Presbytery Office and also a member at Salisbury Church. I had the privilege of working with Deborah for several years. And while her official title was Associate for Stewardship, Deborah did so much more than that title indicates. She was also a patient mentor, excellent proofreader of Presbytery meeting packets, thoughtful provider of devotions for staff meetings, hands-on liaison for numerous POJ ministries, valued analyst of Presbytery meeting feedback, incredible font of institutional knowledge, and so much more. Her smile, positive attitude, and willingness to jump into different roles made her a joy to work with and will continue continue to serve her well in all future endeavors. The POJ staff misses her having her as a part of our team and we wish her much happiness and success in her new position. I am honored to still be able to call her friend. Thank you, Barbara. Next, David Forney. Hi, I'm David Forney, one of the pastors at First Presbyterian Church in Charlottesville. Uh, and while others are uh, rightly sharing all of Debbie's faithful work with the POJ, I want to share the ways in which Debbie has shared her incredible service and leadership at First Pres. Uh, I got to say that while she has uh, stepped away from the POJ work, I'm delighted that that doesn't include her work at First Pres, her home congregation. Uh, so let me uh, offer you a sampling of, of all the ways in which uh, Debbie's uh, livelihood and faith uh, are, are active. Uh, if you are like me, you will find her servant leader capacity uh, to be both inspiring and, well, jaw-dropping. Uh, some of Debbie's contributions at First Press just over the past five years has included singing in our choir. She plays with our hand bell ensemble. She has served on our session for four years. She chaired our $7 million capital campaign. She uh, chaired our adult ministries committee. She started and participates actively in our weekly Div Electio Divinia group. Uh, it, is, um, it is remarkable, uh, all the ways in which you uh, give and thrive, Debbie. Uh, but truly, uh, most of all, uh, Debbie, you are a dear friend to many at First Pres and a faithful child of God in all that you do and say. And so for all of this, uh, we give a thanks to God uh, for your ministry. Thank you, David. Doug Walters. 
As I was making a long drive from the Presbytery office to my home in Charlottesville, I began thinking about our retreat in February. Here are my thoughts. Let me know what you think. Debbie wrote these words in one of the first emails she sent to me after she was nominated to serve as the moderator of the Camp Hanover Ministries Board Purpose Group. Isn't that a mouthful? It was November of 2014, and in her message, Debbie shared a rough sketch of her ideas of what a retreat for ministry board members might look like. Debbie framed the experience with a series of salient and thought-provoking questions. Who are we and what are we doing? And who do we want to be and what do we need to be doing? In asking these questions, Debbie laid out the kindling and lit the spark of the campfire that so brightly burns at Camp Hanover today. Debbie's thoughtful, forward-looking approach as she embarked on her new role as the moderator of the board is a hallmark of her leadership style and skill. I believe Debbie's vision for the board and what Camp Hanover's ministry could become has shaped and transformed this place apart over the last eight years. It's the catalyst that has driven this ministry forward to today. Through her service with Camp Hanover as a board member, as moderator, and as associate for stewardship, Debbie's dedication to this ministry, her passion, enthusiasm, and positivity has been an inspiration. One of her first initiatives as moderator was to put together a task force to explore what it might look like for Camp Hanover to become an incorporated 501c3. Flash forward to June 2019, Camp Hanover Inc. becomes a reality. In her first year, Debbie issued a moderator's challenge to other board members, daring them to dream big and collectively pledge $5,000 in order to purchase either a water slide or a set of stand-up paddle boards so camp campers might enjoy a new activity down at the lake that summer. With Debbie's encouragement, the board pledged double that amount, and as a result, kids were treated to both of those activities. Debbie advocated for participation and engagement, and she led by example, volunteering as a tour guide during numerous open houses and camp fun days, helping greet and welcome campers as they arrived for their first days of summer camp, and memorably, with a flair for the dramatic, as she donned the tunic of a Roman census taker, standing by dutifully on a trail in the solitude of a dark and chilly December night, illuminated only by the light of an oil lantern, directing guests toward Bethlehem as they searched for the Christ child during the annual Hanover Christmas Nativity Walk. Debbie cultivated a culture of philanthropy at Camp Hanover, playing an integral role in the success of the Reach Forward in Faith Capital Campaign and other funds development efforts that continue to pay dividends, grow, and strengthen the camp. When her term of service with the Camp Hanover Board concluded, Debbie left an enduring gift, an essay, or perhaps an invitation of sorts to future moderators and board members entitled, How to Be an Outstanding Board Member. Debbie's instructions began with, pray for the camp, for the staff, the campers, I mean, the community, the work shows. No, those not who are still unaware. Pray for the board and staff, and that our decisions and actions may be grounded in God's love. She championed the expectations of board members to make strong financial commitments and urged each to actively share the Camp Hanover story with their friends, colleagues, and church families. Debbie implored members to constantly look down the road and consider innovations that would advance the Camp Hanover mission in pursuit of its dreams. Eight years later and counting, each new board member upon election to the camp board receives Debbie's invitation as part of their orientation to board service. Debbie concluded this one page call to action with a reminder saying, remember to say thanks. A grateful heart is a quality that flows through Debbie's being and spirit. Let me tell you, nobody can write a note that conveys such deep personal words of support and meaningful thanks as Debbie can. For me, Debbie has been a mentor, a co-pilot and a dear friend. And the importance of expressing one's gratitude for another is one of the most significant lessons I've learned from her. So Debbie, let me say I am, and we the Presbytery are immensely grateful for you and your service and for the impact you've had here and continue to have here. Thank you so, so much. Yeah.
Gordon Mapes. Deborah Presbytery, Gordon Mapes, teaching elder at Chester Presbyterian Church. And Deborah, on behalf of Chester Presbyterian Church and myself, please know of our deep, deep gratitude for coming alongside Presbytery of the James churches and especially Chester, offering wisdom, joyfulness, compassion, care a sense of mission for stewardship. The classes, the seminars, the workshops that you offered, the coaching along the way has made a deep difference to dozens of churches and we are all grateful. Particularly from my perspective, I, I shared just decades ago at another church, I was tasked with leading a debt reduction capital campaign and coaching the church through it. Like many of our churches, the church thought they could do it all by themselves and refused to inquire and hire a counselor or a consultant. It fell flat. There was a lot of regret, a lot of blame, and a lot of problems. A few years ago, when Chester Presbyterian Church embarked upon a debt reduction campaign for a significant debt that was over 20 years old, you coached us, you were here for meetings, you were always available, and you guided us to a good counselor and a good coach who walked us through a very inexpensive yet very, very brilliant campaign. And we were able to retire about 80% of a debt that had been hanging over our heads for many years. And just in the monthly cash flow opened up lots of other avenues for ministry that have turned into things like our garden on the corner and who knows what else. So Deborah, thank you for the years of service know of our regret that it does not continue in this and blessings to first prez if you ever move to Char chester we're here but go go in peace and godspeed to you um i'm katherine jackson and i am a covenant pastor at bot memorial in dewitt virginia Deborah, you have such a creative spirit that I tried to be creative, which falls far short, but here is my thank you using the uh, letters of your first name. D is for dedication to stewardship education and small church ministry for which we are grateful. E is for your excitement about a deeply spiritual subject that many delegate to only raising the budget. B is for bot, for we are forever grateful for O, opening us to a fuller understanding of stewardship. R is for reminding us that Christian stewardship impacts all of life. And A is a gratitude for your ability to meet people where they are in their faith journey and gently move them forward. And finally, H is for the help that you gave to many in this presbytery to grow in their faith. So thank you, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, Deborah, for sharing your faith and commitment. Go with God, for God always goes with you. Hi, Debbie, can you hear me? Sister in Christ, just hearing everybody speak I, confirms how much I look up to you um, and value your contributions to the church I serve, Liz Hume Adam at Tabor Presbyterian, and we're a small church. We participated in your workshops and you've come to our session and during the pandemic you led a retreat for our session you've come to preach for me in my time of need um, i'm thinking about some things that i haven't heard from the beautiful tributes and it's hard to follow all these people off the cuff but i remember looking forward to what you would write and published to everybody in this presbytery. And I read each word which modeled your excellence in not only writing, but your spiritual maturity and your care for churches, all of us. And I think of all of the things that I value as a Presbyterian that you reflect just intelligence and seriousness about what we do, but also um, faithfulness and 
uh, decently and in order, but with optimism. And I think you're, you self-describe yourself as optimistic. And I think that's been borne out in our relationship as a church with you. And I wanna say through these uh, last few years that I think we're parched for optimism and you continue to share that, reflect that. I really look up to you for that. And I um, look forward to you continuing to be a part of the Presbytery. I'm gonna miss you in your role. Um, also, I wanna lift up, and all of you probably have had similar experiences. Somebody had mentioned writing, but writing letters, personal letters to our session members, that you took time out of your busy life to pray for us, to write a note, I mean, you are Christ in our midst. So it's a little awkward being the last to speak uh, because everybody has said so much about what you've done for all of us in our churches. I think it's gonna be a, a big loss um, uh, that I won't have you to call upon, but I know that I can call upon you as a friend and as a sister in Christ. And I wish you um, uh, God's blessing on your new chapter. Uh, we all can confirm that you will be a blessing wherever you go. And I'm really jealous of First Presbyterian Church. I don't believe in poaching, but boy, uh, to hear that, what you continue to do at your home church is astounding. So blessings to you, sister in Christ, Debbie Deborah. So I want to thank the seven people who just spoke, um, those of us who are not among those seven who have worked with Deborah and who just have known Deborah can hear all of our comments and what those seven people said, and we are all very grateful. So Deborah has asked for a chance to speak and to address the body. So Deborah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, moderator, Kenna, and members of the Presbytery, thank you. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for all your kind words. Um, the past six years serving as the Associate for Stewardship were both an honor and a privilege, and I truly believe them to be a special calling. Uh, the Presbytery of the James should be commended for having a vision to create this position. You see, many of you may not realize that this position did not exist in any other presbytery. It was unique and something that other presbyteries and people from other presbyteries were always wanting to know more about. What did I do? How did I do it? So it gave me an opportunity, since it didn't exist anywhere else, to develop the ministry in a way that was unique and specialized to our churches, the churches in our presbytery. The job description was fluid enough to allow me to work on one-on-one -on -one with any congregation, stewardship team, generosity team, pastor, session, in whatever way I could be of assistance. And that might mean driving to bought four Sundays in a row or any other congregation, Sunday school class on generosity. It was workshops and retreats planning the annual stewardship program, working on capital campaigns, and there were seven of them in the time that I served. And then the special gift of, of being able to come and preach and lead worship in the congregations in the Presbytery. I just want to say a special thanks to some people, to Carson Ryan. I don't think he's on the call today, but it was Carson Ryan who had the vision for such a unique role in the Presbytery. I wanna say a special thanks to David Huffine and the members of the search committee who saw in me the gifts needed for this calling. And then finally, a, a special thank you to all the churches who invited me to come and be a part of your ministry with you. I hope my time with the Presbytery was inspirational and encouraged congregations to be grateful, grateful for what you have and generous with all that God has entrusted into your care. Blessings to all of you and thank you for this wonderful opportunity. 
Thank you, Deborah. I'd like to now invite the Presbytery to join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. Good and loving God, we rejoice today that we may celebrate the skills, experiences, and contributions of Deborah Rexroad as the Presbytery's Associate for Stewardship. We give thanks for her presence in our midst and for her faithful leadership of your church and its people. We ask your blessing on and grace to her and her family as she moves into another chapter of her life so that her life may continue to be a light to your word, no matter where she may be. We ask all of this through our saving Lord, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thanks to everyone who has spoken about Deborah, and thank you, Deborah, for being here and for letting us honor you, and God bless you in all of your endeavors going forward. Thank you for the great influence you've had on me. I'm here today because of Deborah, and um, so thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Kenna, for arranging for our opportunity to honor her. Um, please continue Thank with you. your report. Thank you. Uh, I would like to place the following motion in front of the Presbytery to speak to it after it is seconded. The Mission Council moves that the Presbytery elect Marilyn Johns, a ruling elder and Christian educator, to be the Presbytery's interim stated clerk, effective July 1st, 2022, to a part-time staff position with a minimum of 15 hours per week. Thank you, Kenna. You've heard the motion. Is there a second? second? Janet, James, thank you. The motion is to elect ruling elder Marilyn Johns to serve as interim stated clerk, effective July 1, 2022. The motion has been seconded. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to the motion? Kenna. I'd like to explain this. Marilyn is aware that she is being nominated and has agreed to have her name placed in nomination. With Fred Holbrook's pending retirement as the interim general presbyter and stated clerk, the Mission Council prepared a plan for the transition from Fred's combined position to the separated lead presbyter and stated clerk positions in case either or both positions were unfilled when Reverend Holbrook retires on June 30th. The Presbytery Search Committee did not take care of the search of the stated clerk. Instead, the Mission Council charged its personnel committee with the nomination of a stated clerk. Unfortunately, this process by the personnel committee was not completed in time for this meeting, and um, every council of the church has to have a stated clerk. So instead, the Mission Council implemented its, tra implemented its transition plan of nominating a person directly as an interim stated clerk. This new position of stated clerk and this interim position will be responsible for all tasks delineated in the current book of order at G-3.0104. In addition, the position will serve as parliamentarian at presbytery meetings, maintain attendance records for presbytery meetings, calculate the annual commissioner rebalancing, serve as a presbytery officer as required by the rules of discipline, serve as staff resource to the permanent judicial commission and other presbytery committees and commissions, assist and train clerks of session, participate in the association of stated clerks and other tasks as may be determined appropriate. As established in the presbytery's manual of operations at section 3D, the term of a stated clerk shall not exceed three years. The motion does not provide for any other term. So as, and as a part-time staff position, there are no benefits provided. End of my comments. Thank you, Kenna. Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion before the body? Okay, seeing none, uh, I do have a request on chat to post the motion. 
And so I think it is, um, I declare it is timely to vote. And the motion before the body is to elect ruling elder Marilyn Johns to serve as stated clerk effective July 1, 2022. I declare we're ready to vote. Unless I am told otherwise, I see uh, everyone who has voted has voted yes, or that they are not a voting commissioner. So the motion carries. Thank you, moderator. Thank you. The last piece of business is to welcome in our midst a visitor from the Presbyterian Historical Society. I would like to ask that David Staniunas, with apologies if I butchered oh, his name, it. I apologize. I uh, would like to ask that he be granted privilege of the floor to make a brief presentation. Very good. Is there a second to that motion? Okay. There's no uh, objection. Permission to speak is granted. Thank you. David? Thanks very much, moderator. I look forward to hearing from you. Good morning and uh, greetings from the National Archives of the Peace USA. Uh, my name is David. Thank you for giving me the privilege of the floor. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our operations as they uh, have always been from uh, the last 170 years of our existence. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ways that we have changed the way we do business um, amid uh, the trials and tribulations of the last two years. So again, we are the National Archives of the Peace USA. We're located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have more than 36,000 cubic feet of original records going back to the first Presbytery meeting uh, in America in 1706, um, a gathering not too dissimilar to this one. Um, we hold the original records of national agency offices, of world mission records, of uh, presbyteries and synods and of individual congregations. And so if I have uh, one ask for you uh, in your congregations, it's to spare a thought for your original records of permanent value, your session minutes and registers, historic photographs, um, and get them into a location where they're safe from uh, heat, water, light, uh, and theft. Um, that's one ask of you. Uh, we bring in more than 500 cubic feet of records every single year, um, and we have an extensive digitization operation. We image about 100,000 pages of text and images every year, um, and we host the majority of that uh, material in our online collections. And that's sort of what we do in broad outline. Um, the vicissitudes of the pandemic um, changed a lot of uh, how we behave and how we attempt to gather and record uh, the records of Presbyterianism in this country and worldwide. We were closed for two months um, and had to find a way to, uh, to live into the moment and, and find ways to remind Presbyterians of who you are and what you do together. Our first kind of um, curated collection during that period was called the Easter COVID uh, Sermons Collection. Um, I'm putting a link couple of links in the chat. Um, we gathered more than 80 um, sermons from online sources uh, from individual congregations um, who had begun to do new forms of worship um, in this era that we've uh, come to understand is ongoing. Um, over the course of 2020, of course, um, there was a massive um, upspring of uh, uh, unrest in this country surrounding uh, chiefly the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, Richmond, of course, knows well uh, that period of tumult. Um, and we sought to document Presbyterian responses to and accompaniment with the renaissance Black Lives Matter movement um, in another collection of videos uh, that we have called the Racial Justice Collection. Um, that body of videos uh, spans uh, news footage and sermons and individual uh, testimonials from 2005 uh, through to the present day. Um, among the other things that we're doing to kind of uh, respond to the historical necessity of broadening and diversifying our collections is ever since 2018, we have run what's called the African American Leaders and Congregations Collecting Initiative. Um, this has set aside uh, 
five figure tranche of, of money to support uh, digitization of the original records of any historically black Presbyterian church um, to the tune of about 1200 pages. Um, please contact me with um, any more information if uh, you or someone you know uh, fits that description and is in need of our services. Um, and finally, the chief thing that we've done over the past two years via AALC money um, is we have begun to completely digitize the personal records of Katie Geneva Cannon. This is an interinstitutional partnership um, between us and Union Seminary in Richmond and Union Seminary in New York. Um, it was Katie's will that her records be divided among our institutions. Um, we have kind of the most churchy stuff <laughs> um, and uh, Union in New York has her kind of academic and um, kind of uh, more of her academic writing. Um, we began imaging records in February of 21. Um, we are likely to complete that project uh, late this year or early next. Um, that will be when it's all said and done uh, in excess of 25,000 pages of text, images, um, and dozens of hours of audio and video. And folks in the chat uh, can see links to our digital collection of Katie's work there. Um, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for letting me address you. And I'll hang out in the chat uh, in case folks have any questions for us. Peace. Thank you, David. And I invite anyone who has questions for David to use the chat function in Zoom. If there's anyone in the room that has a question for David, please raise your hand now. Thank you. Kenna? Thank you, David, for joining us today. And that concludes the Mission Council report. Thank you, Kenna. I now call on ruling elder Stephen Hicks, president of the trustees of Presbytery of the James, Inc to give its report, which starts on page 13 of the packet. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, moderator. As moderator mentioned, the report is on page 13. The trustees do have one recommendation. This came about from the um, February 19 meeting, uh, and it's re in response to the PILP grant payoffs that the trustees uh, did in December of 2021. Uh, it was noted that we had actually not requested uh, permission from the presbytery. So as presented in the packet on February 19, 2022, stated meeting of the presbytery, and as explained in response to a question, the trustees request that Presbytery of the James ratify action that was taken by the trustees on December 6, 2021 to pay off the Presbyterian Investment and Loan Program, PILP, uh, church mortgage grants for four historically black churches. Moderator, on behalf of the trustees, I move the adoption of this recommendation. Thank you, Steve. The recommendation is to ratify the trustees action in December 2021 to pay off four congregations PILP mortgage grants. The motion does not require a second. Is there anyone who wishes to speak to the motion? Okay, seeing none, I declare that we are ready to vote. So there's a poll that's been launched by Zoom. Shall the Presbytery of the James ratify the action of the trustees to pay off the PILP grants? Thank you. Um, there are two no votes by Zoom. All other votes in all forms are yes. I declare that the motion passes. Steve, anything else for the trustees? No, moderator, that completes our report at this time. Thank you, Steve. Um, 11.08, we'll press on. 
Um, I call on certified Christian educator Barbara Flint, co-chair of the Presbyter Search Committee, to give its report, which can be found on page 14 of the packet. Good morning, Barbara. And please be very close to the microphone when you speak. Thank you, moderator. Since this report was written, we have had round two of interviews for one of the other two part-time presbyter positions. We invited two candidates to in-person interviews on June 2nd, and we have made an offer to one of those candidates. This candidate is now on the docket to meet with the examination committee in July. We will be having another round of in-person interviews later this week for the second part-time presbyter position. And if the spirit moves and the way be clear, we hope to make an offer next week. If this does happen, then we'll have two candidates, one for each position, come before the examinations committee at their July meeting. We continue to seek the spirit in our meetings and deliberations to discern the people whom God has already chosen to be our presbyters and continue to ask for your prayers as we go about our work. Moderator, this concludes my report. Thank you, Barbara. I see that Alan Fisher has raised his hand. Alan, if you would like to address the body, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Just a, a question of information. Uh, has there been any contact with the new lead presbyter and what role are they playing in these conversations at this point? Thank you, Alan, for that question. Yes, our lead presbyter has had Zoom conversations with the candidates that have been invited to come in person. And then after our interview, uh, Reverend Flo has given us her feeling as to whether she could work with the candidates. And she will also be talking with the candidates that are coming in later this week. So she has been a part of this process, but she does not have a vote in the decision-making. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Alan. And I wanna hold up Alan taking the initiative to raise his hand to speak uh, as a model for all of us participating by Zoom in particular, if you wish to speak, please do as Alan has done. Um, any other questions for the committee? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, moderator. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back from our break. I now call on teaching elder Walter Cantor moderator of the Committee on Nominations to give its report, which begins on page 14 of the packet. Good morning, Walter. Good morning, thank you, moderator. Uh, as you can see, we are putting forward two names uh, on our written report, and I also have two more names to add to that. Uh, do we, are we voting on each name individually or do you want me to put all, all the names out there all at once? What would be your preference? Let, let's, let's put all four in nomination together. All right. Well, I will copy and put the two into the chat, uh, to help everybody out who's online. Uh, the two names that I'm adding to the list of the committee is bringing forward, uh, to the list are uh, Reverend Lauren Ramsier. Uh, she's the teaching elder from Voices of Jubilee. We're putting her name forward to serve on the mission and service team for the class of 2024. And uh, we're also bringing forward ruling elder Natasha Taylor. Uh, she is from Salisbury uh, and she's being put forward for vice moderator of the leadership connections team, also class of 2024. And it's not noted in the written report, but uh, Joseph Tabor is being put forward to serve on West, Westminster Presbyterian Homes. That is also class of 2024. And those are the names we are bringing forward. Okay. Thank you, Walter. I note in the, in the committee's report, ruling elder Wayne Johnston 
is nominated to serve on the Commission on Ministry class of 2023. So that is the fourth name that is being nominated. So as we're working up a poll, all four names? Wonderful. Okay, before we vote, let me ask if anyone wishes to nominate him, him or her or their self or someone else to any of the positions that are open for nomination. So, in other words, I'm taking nominations from the floor. Would you like me to read off open positions? Because they're not written <laughs> in my report. Um, that's not necessary today, Walter, okay. thank you. I think you, you will, you have communicated or will be communicating that with the Presbytery. Yes, answer your phones when we call. Okay, seeing no nominations from the floor, I declare that we are ready to vote. So the poll is, shall the Presbytery elect the individuals listed in the CON report and those additional persons nominated this morning for service Excuse in the Presbytery? Is there a question? Yes, this is Crystal Parker at Salisbury. Natasha is able to serve in this, but she is not a ruling elder. She would just be a member from the church. Okay, that, that the position that uh, she's being nominated for, she can serve uh, as a member of church. I just had inaccurate information, <laughs> sorry. It's okay, wanted to make sure it was clear in the minutes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Crystal. Okay, thank you. Uh, everyone who has voted has voted yes, so I declare that the motion carries. Thank you, Walter. Anything else from the Committee on Nominations? Yes, uh, we hope to interview uh, candidates for vice moderator for 2023, and then ideally to be moderator in 2024. So if you are a ruling elder or you know of a ruling elder, who would be amazing as Presbytery moderator, uh, please send that name along. We are accepting nominations and we hope to be uh, speaking, to, um, speaking to candidates for that position in August. So send those names uh, my way or to anyone else who serves on nominating committee. There's also a form online that you can fill out. That information gets to us too. So just all those people who you think would be great to be, uh, be in Dan's shoes. Uh, send those names toward me. Thank you so much. Thank you, moderator. That concludes my report. Thank you, Walter. I call on ruling Elder Glenna Finnicum, moderator of the Commission on Ministry, whose report begins on page 15 of the packet. Good morning again, Glenna. Good morning, moderator. We as a Presbytery have a new examination process in which part one occurs in the Commission on Ministry. This part includes determining suitability of the candidate for the call, as well as questions in the areas of Bible, general and reformed theology, worship and sacraments, and polity. Part two invites the candidates to either preach a sermon, teach a lesson, or provide an exposition of some aspect of the ministry to which the today is called. Let me call on Melissa Phillips, moderator of our examinations committee. Melissa. Oh, again, this morning we have the privilege of introducing three wonderful candidates for ministry here in our presbytery. First, Kelly Connolly, who has been called to serve as resident minister, U Kirk at VCU. Rachel Sutphin, who has been called to serve as Covenant Pastor 2 at First Church in Charlottesville, and Jane Morgan, who has been called to serve as Resident Chaplain at Westminster Canterbury here in Richmond. 
Um, our procedure today has two parts. Each of the candidates will preach a sermon and then share highlights of their, their faith journey in the breakout room. Uh, they will be offered, invited to read a prayer, read a scripture, and then share their sermon. After the sermon, the host of each breakout room asks if there are any questions or comments for the candidate regarding the sermon only. When there are no further questions, uh, the breakout room host moves that the presbytery approve the preaching portion of the ordination, ordination examinations for the candidate, and we will um, we will have all joined you again at that time. So now we are going to head into the breakout rooms. I will be hosting one. Uh, Reverend Seth Lovell will be hosting another, and Reverend Mary Newburn Williams will be hosting the third. Thank you, Melissa. For folks here at Westminster, Jay Morgan will be preaching here in the sanctuary. And if you wish to hear Rachel or Kelly preach, um, breakout rooms are down the hall, one, rooms 112 and 113. I was with the group that heard Rachel, and we indeed recommend that the sermon portion be approved. Thank you, Mary. Melissa? Yes. Um, as we are reassembling, and I think all rooms are back together. Okay. Um, but I would entertain a motion from the committee to approve the three sermons. So moved. Okay. There's a second in the room from multiple people. Is there... Okay, any discussion? Any comments? Okay, seeing none, I declare that the preaching portion of the ordination examination for Kelly, Rachel, and Jay has been approved. <clears throat> Thank you, moderator. I'm now gonna ask each candidate to briefly describe some of the highlights of your faith journey that brought you to the point where you are standing before the presbytery today. First, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope that I can be heard okay. Um, thank you to those of you who have been a part of making this happen. Um, I'll try to keep this somewhat brief, but as most of you know, since this is majority clergy, um, you know, a lot of experiences and time go into <laughs> getting to this place. Um, but I talked about in my sermon, this idea of the royal priesthood as community, that these two words are synonymous for each other. And community is definitely a big factor um, of my faith journey thus far. I was raised in the church. Um, my mother was a minister of music at our church. I was raised in the United Methodist Church and um, had wonderful experiences of community and fellowship and mission and learning about Jesus in a very impactful way through mentors and, and clergy and my mother. And that um, experience definitely stayed with me throughout college and throughout my um, first couple of jobs after college. And I was working at First Presbyterian Church Winchester where uh, I started to regain the sense of call to ministry, something I had felt early on. And I'm thankful to them for being my sponsoring congregation all throughout this journey. Uh, again, each of these places, my home church, First Presbyterian Winchester, and now Second Presbyterian in Richmond, have all just modeled for me this royal priesthood, a great holy nation, this kingdom calling that we call community. It's been a wonderful experience. It's been tiring and challenging. It, uh, I think that um, 
maybe literal blood, sweat, and tears go into <laughs> theological education and training, vocational training. But again, that aspect of community is what makes it all worth it, what is what makes me feel supported and encouraged to keep pursuing God's call. So that's a little bit about me in a couple of minutes. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> I now move that the Presbytery declare that Kelly Connolly has passed the final step of the ordination examination and is approved for ordination to ministry of the word and sacrament. Thank you, Melissa. Is there a second to this motion? Janet, thank you. I declare, that, I may ask if there's any further discussion. Very good. Seeing none, I declare that the body is ready to vote. Zoom poll has been posted. Shall the Presbytery declare that Kelly Connolly has passed the final step of the ordination exam and is approved for ordination to ministry of the word and sacrament? Thank you, everyone. I declare that the motion is approved. Congratulations, Kelly. Melissa, Thank you, please everyone. Please. Thank you, Kelly, and it was it was a pleasure. Next, I would like to invite Rachel to share a little bit about her faith journey and what brought her here today. Thank you, Melissa. I like to often begin my faith journey of one of my earliest memories, and that is we were planning to move actually from Charlottesville to a new area. And I remember praying that night of, God, I am scared, please go with me. And the prayer has been a continuing factor in my life and spiritual practices as well, of wanting to have that relationship with God and sharing with others of, this is how we could relate to our creator and live responsibly in the world. Once we lived in Charlottesville, we attended church quite often. I'm sorry, Christiansburg, excuse me. We attended church quite often for Sunday school and choir. I grew up knowing that this was a community who was very supportive of me and showed up for my concerts and recitals, as well as the harder moments in my life. I was very much looking forward to confirmation. So I wanted to be able to divide, dive more into what does faith look like individually and communally. I was in my church, we partner our youth with a mentor and my mentor and I did a lot together and really engaged in the gospel text, as well as ended up during confirmation, we decided to read the entire Bible together, which is a large project to undertake. <laughs> and while in confirmation, I also discovered my love for Presbyterian polity. And I joined the Presbyterian Youth Council and was constantly looking at other ways to get involved and later became a youth elder and loved my time serving on committees and being able to work together for group discernment. And that group discernment piece connects me back to my desire to engage in prayer and spiritual practices. After confirmation, I did spend a while looking at other denominations because I wanted to be sure that I was Presbyterian because I was Presbyterian and not because my parents were. However, I found myself constantly coming back to Presbyterianism, largely because of our government and our dedication to Reformation. And those were two very important pieces for me and continue to be. I did my first church internship when I was in college. I began preaching at a local church called Northside Presbyterian Church. I remember being in the pulpit for the first time and the slowly feeling that nervousness go away to excitement, that I had spent all this research or on this sermon and just wanted to share with the congregation of this is the this is secret I found I want to tell you and I want you to go on and tell other people. And that joy continues with me today as I continue to preach and engage different congregations and ages. After serving at Northside Presbyterian Church in college, I very quickly knew that it was be important to continue my studies to seminary. I went to Columbia Theological Seminary, half in person and half online due to COVID. And at Columbia Theological Seminary, I experienced a lot of community as well as non-traditional faith um, ministry settings. I served in the hospitals as well as nursing homes and learned there the importance of being with people in their grief. And that is where I discovered my love for pastoral care. 
And pastoral care has meant a lot to me on my own faith journey. It was a wonderful opportunity to give that back to others as well. Currently, I have accepted a call to First Presbyterian in Charlottesville, in part because of my faith journey and the importance the church was to me as a youth and as a child, and wanting to give that back to youth and children to know that they have a person in the church who cares and is looking out for them. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> And so now, Mr. Moderator, I move that Presbytery declare that Rachel Sutton has passed the final step of the ordination examination and is approved for ordination and ministry of the word and sacrament. Thank you, Melissa. Is there a second to this motion? Claim a call. Second. Any further second. discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I declare that the body is ready to vote. So Zoom poll has been released. Shall the Presbytery declare that candidate Rachel Sutphin has passed the final step of the ordination exam and is approved for ordination to ministry of the word and sacrament? Thank you everyone for voting. I declare that the motion is approved. Congratulations, Rachel. Wonderful. Welcome, Rachel. And now I would like to ask Jay Morgan to share briefly his faith journey um, and what brought him here with us today. Good. All right. Um, so I um, first felt a call to ministry in 2015. Um, I'd been selling software for about five years. Um, and I was um, very empty, didn't feel good. And um, somebody asked me if I'd ever thought about going into ministry. And it was very palpable, the sort of catharsis that happened. Um, and I started mulling it over and I ran away for a minute from the idea. And then I kept coming back to it, wrestling with it for a couple of years. And um, I think that the reason that I feel called to ministry is that um, in my sufferings, in my own sufferings, and um, in the sufferings that I've witnessed in other people's lives near me and who I've had the um, opportunity to, to witness as a firefighter in college and as uh, doing a service trip to Honduras in high school, um, God meets us in the thick spaces. Um, we often talk about thin space, like places where there, there's just the veil is thinner between this place and the next. Um, and and I find that um, for me, thin spaces are also thick in that um, the times when I have seen the worst um, that this world can do to somebody, orphan a kid in Honduras, or, um, you know, make covered in scars, you know, in a fire, um, or um, witness a terrible murder-suicide um, on the side of the road on a beautiful summer day uh, in Swanee, Tennessee. Um, there is something to God's presence in those places that I cannot help but, but sense. And, um, and for me, I, I want to be a witness to the suffering that is happening, um, but also be a a beacon of, well, somebody who carries practices hope. Um, because those spaces where calamity strikes and all seems to be falling down, they don't last forever. And they um, teach us something of God's abiding presence with us. And they, the valleys of life give us the chance to look up at 
towards a horizon, towards uh, a greater future and a greater present, and they give us uh, comfort. So they being the visions that we have in moments of terror and calamity and trauma. Um, I was a resident at VCU Health, um, a chaplain resident, and I loved the work and it took a whole lot out of me too because I, um, I wasn't quite ready to know where I ended and others began and I wasn't quite ready to know that I actually can't fix anything in those situations. I need to just be there. Um, and I learned that at VCU. And I also learned that I really miss having relationships with people in ongoing ways. Um, I averaged one visit per patient or family at VCU Health, naturally, because the turnover was so fast. And so I felt called to find a place, especially given my love for older people, uh, where I could have a relationship with them. And then when the fixed spaces come, um, we have trust and we know each other and um, we can recalibrate ourselves in loving relationship away from just the pain and just the despair. Not to take it away, not to paint over it, but um, to look at it in context of a greater loving relationship that we might share with each other and that we might share with God. Um, and so I hope that makes sense. Um, but I'm called to pastoral care, to practice pastoral care in this season, um, which is helping folks make meaning, find meaning when things might be seeming to fall apart. Um, pick up the pieces like a mosaic and put them back together in a more beautiful way if they're so willing. But I am just a witness to it. And it's such a gift to witness the resilience of the human spirit and the resilience of God's presence, the, the resilience that God's presence gives us. Um, and it, so that's all I'll say right now. Thank you, Jay. I move that the presby presbytery declare that Jay Morgan has passed the final step of the ordination examination and is approved for ordination to the ministry of the word and sacrament. Thank you, Melissa. Is there a second to this motion? Many seconds. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, I declare that the body is ready to vote. Shall the Presbytery declare that candidate Jay Morgan has passed the final step of the ordination exam and is approved for ordination to ministry of the word and sacrament. Seeing no votes, I declare that the motion passes. Congratulations. <laughs> and that concludes the examinations process, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Melissa. I'd ask everyone to join me in prayer. Eternal God, we rejoice with all who know Kelly, Rachel, and Jay, and all whom they will meet and serve, that you have called each of them to a particular ministry, and each has responded faithfully to your call. We also rejoice that Rachel, Jay, and Kelly will enhance the mission and ministry of this Presbytery. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide, comfort, encourage, and love each of them as they share the good news of the gospel. 
Help all of us also, Lord, to be faithful with our commitment of love, support, and prayer for Jay, Kelly, and Rachel. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Glenna, is there anything else from the Commission on Ministry? Yes, there is. Moderator, on page 18 of the packet, the Commission on Ministry has two more items for action. First, the Commission moves that the Presbytery grant permission for a commissioned pastor to administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper when authorized by the commissioned pastor committee and when invited by the session in a church in which they are not commissioned to serve. Thank you, Glenna. This motion comes from the commission and does not require a second. Does anyone wish to address the motion? Okay, seeing no raised hands, I declare that the body is ready to vote. A poll will be posted. Shall the Presbytery grant permission for a commissioned pastor to administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper when authorized by the commission pastor committee and when invited by the session in a church in which they are not commissioned to serve? Okay. I see 90, uh, by Zoom, 99 votes, four, three against. Uh, by phone, one, four, everyone in the room voted yes. So the motion passes. Please continue, Glenna. The Commission on Ministry moves that the Presbytery approve a 4% increase in the minimum compensation criteria for the year 2023. Thank you, Glenna. The motion does not require a second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Okay. Seeing no raised hands, I declare that the body is ready to vote. The motion before us is whether the Presbytery shall approve a 4% increase in the minimum compensation criteria for 2023. Thank you. Everyone who has voted has voted yes. So the motion carries. Thank you, Glenna. Uh, anything else from the Commission on Ministry? That's all from the Commission on Ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Glenna. I call upon Janet Winslow for the report of the Committee on Preparation for Ministry. Good afternoon, Janet. Moderator, the Committee on Preparation for Ministry is happy to present inquirer Robbie DeRazio to be examined and we recommend received as a candidate for the Ministry of Word and Sacrament. Earlier today in the consent agenda, the Presbytery approved our committee's recommendation to examine Robbie for candidacy and we would like to proceed with that examination now. Please do so, Jim. Robbie's file is complete and in order. In addition, he has met with the Committee on Preparation for Ministry and has been examined in his faith, his sense of call, and his service to the church. The committee interviewed him on March 22nd, 2022 and approved him for candidacy. Robbie, we all rejoice with you today at your decision to prepare for this ministry as a minister of the word and sacrament. And we invite you to share with the members of the Presbytery three different things, your personal faith and experience of God's grace, your call to the ministry of the word and sacrament and your motives for seeking this ministry and ways in which you've served the church, which affirm your call. After you speak, the Presbytery will be free to ask questions on these same three topics. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody um, for the opportunity to be here um, and share a little bit about the work God has done uh, in, in my life. So 
But that being said, um, I believe God has always been working in and through my experiences and through the people that God has placed in my life that have led me here today. One experience in particular uh, that was uh, really transformative for me personally was uh, participating in my first mission trip um, with Swift Creek Presbyterian Church. Uh, it, was a, it was with the youth group. Uh, I was in ninth grade going into 10th grade and uh, we were going to this uh, in Big Laurel, Kentucky is where we were going. And as someone growing up who was a homebody and, and was really fearful to go, there was something stirred up in me, sort of a will to go. And as I went on that trip, one word I would kind of use to describe what that trip meant for me is it, it felt like home. I didn't have to be anybody but myself. And I was welcomed with open arms by the group, even though I didn't have many prior relationships with them. I got to experience what it felt like to be part of something that was bigger than myself. Even though it was only a week, I got to be a part of uh, a group of people, a group of young people who were living with a purpose to make God's love known to the community around them through their service, through, through love, and through just creating that connection. I got the opportunity to uh, paint a house, uh, build a wheelchair ramp, and I create a connection with, with that community. And that experience was incredibly impactful on me and it still impacts me to today. And ultimately on that trip, I felt a sense of belonging for the first time in my life and experienced the grace of God for me on that trip meant, meant letting go of the external circumstances that so often define my life, whether it be anxiety or overwhelmingness or pressure that I felt at a, as a young person or insecurities. And I had to let go of those external circumstances and I found rest in God's story and, in the, and I found peace in God's grace for me. My imperfectedness, imperfection no longer defined me, but it was, it was being a child of God is what really, that position is what began to define my life. And this kind of brings me to my sense of call and motives for seeking a calling. Um, as I said before, the, the one word I used to describe that trip, uh, was it felt like home. And as one of my favorite, I have many uh, uh, favorite professors, but one of my favorite professors at Union Presbyterian Seminary, uh, Dr. Carson Brisson always said in a closing benediction, he would, he would say this, he says, he would say amazing words, but he, he would say, those most home seek those most least home. And that, is, that really struck a chord with me. And I think that has really impacted my, my being to this day. Uh, and to me, I, home means bringing together a group of people like I had on, on that mission trip by, by the love and the grace of God and love and grace for one another and making that love known to the surrounding community and, and doing life together uh, and growing together with one another. And further, I believe my call is, is to enhance a, a place of belonging um, for all people to experience God's grace and through embodying the person and work of Jesus Christ, to embody the compassion, the selflessness, the desire for real and authentic relationships, and ultimately being utterly dependent on God through, through it all. I was really fortunate to have found a place of belonging on that mission trip. Uh, and that sense of belonging was enhanced through my growing knowledge and understanding of who Jesus was and is today, which, is which was revealed to me through the scriptures. Uh, and so many people that God has placed in my life as mentors who have just their wisdom has been bestowed upon me and um, so much knowledge um, that I've, I've learned from. And ultimately where I feel God is leading at this moment is is a call to continue to equip those who have experienced the grace of God and to seek those who have not yet found rest in Jesus and offer them a place of belonging, uh, of welcome. Um, and personally, I currently serve as the youth director of Swift Creek Presbyterian Church, which is my home church. Um, and during this time, I've, I've had the opportunity to build amazing relationships with young people. 
to teach God's word and to walk alongside students in a time in their life that is filled with so, so many pressures and uncertainties of the future and to point them to the rest that, I, that is found in Jesus. Uh, I've had the, the privilege to preach, um, to lead Bible study, to go on mission trips, and to I also served at a, um, another youth group during my undergraduate experience. Um, but uh, and, and also currently I've taken uh, and passed five, four of the five ordination exams. Um, and this summer I'm currently enrolled in the summer CPE program at Virginia Commonwealth, uh, Virginia Health. So um, this journey has and will continue to mold and shape the, my call. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to continue to grow into that, whatever that may be. Um, and uh, just, just excited for this process. And um, I just wanna say thank you again for uh, this opportunity, so. Moderator, the Presbytery may now ask Robbie questions on the on the three topics he addressed. Thank you, Janet. The floor is now open for anyone who wishes to question Robbie about and only about his personal faith, his sense of call to the ministry, and ways he has served the church. Beth Lewis, please unmute yourself and direct your question to Robbie. Hi, Robbie. It's Beth. Um, I serve as a ruling elder at SCPC, where Robbie is. I don't really have a question, but I just want to tell Robbie how proud we are of him. <clears throat> and it doesn't surprise me. I had um, the privilege of having Robbie in junior worship many, many, many years ago. And... Um, he was just always very inquisitive and um, I probably learned more from him than uh, he did from me. So thank you, Robbie, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Beth. Any other questions for Robbie? Okay. Robbie, I commend you for a statement that left us all, if not speechless, at least very much satisfied with uh, your background on those three topics. So since there are no more questions, I invite a motion concerning this. Thing. Moderator, I move that the Presbytery of the James declare itself satisfied as to Robbie D'Orazio's purpose and promise for ministry of the word and sacrament and proceed to receive him as a candidate for that ministry. Thank you, Janet. Is there a second for the motion? Ken Payne? Second. It is moved and seconded that Presbytery receive Robbie D'Orazio as a candidate. Does anyone wish to debate or address the motion? Okay, seeing none, I declare that we are ready to vote. The motion is, shall the Presbytery declare itself satisfied as to Robbie's purpose and promise for the ministry of the word and sacrament and proceed to receive him as a candidate? Okay, all commissioners voting have voted yes, so the motion carries. Congratulations, Robbie. We will now proceed to the ceremony of reception of the candidate. Robbie, the office that you seek is not to be committed to unworthy persons. And there is need for both training and trial of a person's gifts before ordination to the ministry. That is why you have been examined by the session at Swift Creek Church by the Committee on Preparation for Ministry and by the Presbytery. 
as to your desire to be received as a candidate for the ministry of the word and sacrament. Each body has affirmed you in that desire. Will you now please respond in the affirmative to the following questions, indicating your desire to accept the responsibilities and commitments of a candidate for the ministry of the word and sacrament? Yes. Thank you. Do you believe yourself to be called by God to the ministry of the word and sacrament? I do. Do you promise in reliance upon the grace of God to maintain a Christian character and to conduct and to be diligent and faithful in making full preparation for this ministry? I do. Do you accept the proper supervision of the presbytery in matters that concern your preparation for the ministry? I do. Do you desire now to be received by this presbytery as a candidate for the ministry of the word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA? I do. I call upon the Reverend Nicole Ball to charge the candidate. Congratulations, Robbie. I have no doubt in this next phase that you will do all of the things. Uh, you have been an awesome uh, liaison and a candidate to work with. It's been a pleasure to be your liaison. Um, the boxes will be checked. You will make it towards the end, but I just want to charge you to remember that this next preparation phase is really about a deepening an understanding of God's presence in your life and in the world, a deep knowing that will start to blossom and bloom as you get into this next phase. So today, uh, these aren't my words, but I charge you to take off your shoes from Macrina Wiedeker. My bare feet walk the earth reverently for everything keeps crying, take off your shoes. The ground you stand on is holy. The ground of your being is holy. When the wind sings through the pines like a breath of God, awakening you to the sacred present, calling your soul to new insights, take off your shoes. When the sun rises above your rooftop, coloring your world with dawn, be receptive to this awesome beauty. Put on your garment of adoration. Take off your shoes. When the red maple drops its last leaf of summer, wearing its burning bush robes no longer, Read between its barren branches and take off your shoes. When sorrow presses close to your heart, begging you to put your trust in God alone, filling you with a quiet knowing that God's hand is not too short to heal you, take off your shoes. When a new person comes into your life like a mystery about to unfold and you find yourself marveling over the frailty and splendor of every human being, take off your shoes. When during the wee hours of the night, you drive slowly into the new day and the morning's fog like angel wings hovers mysteriously above you, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes of distraction. Take off your shoes of ignorance and blindness. Take off your shoes of hurry and worry. Take off anything that prevents you from being a child of wonder. Take off your shoes for the ground you stand on is holy. The ground you are is holy. Amen. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kenya. Thank you, Nicole. Um, my other microphone just ran out of power. I call upon ruling elder John Burns to lead the presbytery in prayer for God's blessing. Uh, Robbie, uh, first off, congratulations on your journey, and uh, let's pray. Lord, we just lift up our brother Robbie, that you just continue to be with him as he grows in service, that you would give him grace, give him wisdom, discernment, and that he would truly be the hands and feet of Jesus as he reaches out to youth and elders and uh, whoever in his journey as a in this ministry to serve you lord and we just lift 
Robbie up and just ask your continued blessing on him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I declare that Robbie Durazio is hereby received as a candidate for the ministry of the word and sacrament. And I direct that his name be recorded in the Presbytery's role of candidates for that ministry. Robbie, may God bless you now and always as you seek to serve God. Moderator, this concludes our report. Thank you, Janet. I call on teaching elder George Whipple, moderator of the Leadership Connections team, to give its report, which begins on page 61 of the packet. Good afternoon, George. Good afternoon, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the Leadership Connection team is proud to share with you a bit of, of uh, some of the ministries that uh, are taking place in the name of the Presbytery. Um, you can read about those ministries, uh, and several have submitted some detailed reports. Um, just a reminder, uh, you can go to the Presbytery's website uh, and gain some insight uh, as to all these various ministries that are taking place, uh, and they all need your support. Um, so if you've got time, please volunteer for one. And this concludes my report. Thank you, George. I call on teaching elder Mary Jane Winter, moderator of the mission and service team, to give its report, which begins on page 64 of the packet. Good afternoon, Mary Jane. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yes, the report begins on page 64. And since we're ahead of time, I guess I can take about 20 minutes. <laughs> no, but I would like to call your attention. I would like to call your attention to several of the reports that, uh, that you will find on pages 64 and 65. The hunger ministry has to address hunger in this presbytery region and around the world. And it can only give as much as you contribute whether it's through your five cents a meal offering or whether it is through a designated gift to the presbytery. So help us, help us to give more. Um, as Matthew 25 congregations, do not let us neglect to see those who are hungry and to respond. This is just uh, one of the most exciting ministries in this presbytery, but it needs your help. Self-development of people also has grants to give. Those come from our one great hour of sharing. And so if you know of a group or of an organization that fits with the self-development criteria, please be in touch with this ministry team so that they can give more to transform lives in this presbytery. And then finally, uh, the World Mission Ministry has a number of an announcements uh, to make. Um, first, we will again have an international peacemaker with us uh, in October. Uh, her work is with refugees, so this is a very timely topic for us, and you will have opportunities to connect with her in October when she is here. Um, also, as you heard, uh, Cindy Coral is, uh, is available to speak. She's available to speak uh, and to preach in your congregations. She says that her calendar has begun to fill up for the summer, but she is available in September and October and throughout uh, the fall. So if, if you have um, space on your calendar, invite her to your church. Cindy uh, also has reminded me that uh, Hunter Farrell's new book, uh, Freeing Congregations, uh, is out, and she is available to lead a Zoom uh, book study uh, on this uh, important uh, new book by Hunter Farrell. He is the former director of World Mission for the Presbyterian Church and is currently the director of the Global Mission Initiative of Pittsburgh Presbytery. And uh, in addition, Hunter will be leading a webinar uh, on this uh, book and helping all of us 
try to rethink and re-envision how we can best engage in God's mission in the world as congregations. So stay tuned for that uh, announcement. And if you would like to be uh, involved in uh, a Zoom uh, book study, please let me know or be in touch with the Presbytery. Mr. Moderator, this concludes our report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Jane. I now call on Doug Walters, Executive Director of Camp Hanover to present the camp's report, which begins on page 66 of the packet. Good afternoon, Doug. Good afternoon, moderator. I am very excited to be with you today because I get to share with you a bold new vision, mission, and strategic plan that the Board of Directors has recently adopted for Camp Hanover. I wanna start by taking you back to the before times, before vaccines and booster shots, before mask mandates and lockdowns, even before Tom Hanks announced that he had COVID on the same night that the NCAA canceled March Madness. At 63 years old, Camp Hanover has just become a fledgling 501c3 organization. It was the beginning of a new chapter in the Camp Hanover story. In restructuring Camp Hanover into an incorporated nonprofit, the goals outlined in the long range plan developed by the Presbytery way back in 2006 were complete. And so in February of 2020, the board of directors <clears throat> looked to the horizon. They determined their next step was to lay out a vision and long range plan for the next period of Camp Hanover's ministry. And in grand Presbyterian fashion, a task force was appointed and the journey began. Little did we know that the next month and the months beyond and what they would bring, how the world would change and how much more imperative it would be to have a clear vision and a roadmap to guide Camp Hanover into the future. With such a significant paradigm shift looming, looking back now, the timing was providential. In August of 2020, at the recommendation of the task force, the board of directors entered into a relationship with a Richmond-based consulting firm, the Spark Mill. And over the next eight months, the board worked with Sarah Milston and Chris Bennett, first to research and understand the needs of those who had historically been served through Camp Hanover, and to identify potential opportunities to expand Camp Hanover's ministry and outreach. Over the next eight months, Chris and Sarah worked closely with the board and staff through a series of visioning and planning retreats. The Spark Mill conducted interviews with Presbytery leaders, parents of campers, donors, retreat organizers, and leaders at other camps in the Presbyterian Church USA and other denominations. They held directed conversations with current alumni and summer camp staff. They had several thousand retreat participants and campers who have attended camp programs over the last decade surveyed in an effort to discover detailed information about Camp Hanover's strengths and shortfalls. The data collected, informed, and illuminated the next phase, excuse me, the next phase <clears throat> of the process. Task force members uh, evaluated and refined and sharpened their focus, affirming and to putting into words the values and historical foundation that Camp Hanover is built on. It's a foundation driven by relationship with God and each other, formed in small groups, a foundation built on the natural beauty of Camp Hanover that's offered as sacred space, and a foundation rooted in the love of Jesus Christ and the call to love one another. The board spent many hours defining our beliefs. We believe in welcome and inclusion, since Camp Hanover's beginning in 1957 as a racially integrated camp, it has been important that all people are welcome and valued here. We aim to live out this mission and this ministry by following the greatest commandment that Christ taught us, to love our neighbors as ourself. We understand this teaching as being inclusive of everyone with no exceptions. We believe. We believe people are shaped by the experience they share with one another. The small group model that is a signature of the Camp Hanover's experience guides each child of God to live faithfully to the world beyond camp as the world of camp has been faithful to them. 
We believe in connection to creation. We believe when we connect with creation, we also grow in our relationships with God, with one another. And as our relationships grow, we can hear God's call to connect with and steward God's creation. With this solid foundation and a defined set of beliefs, the board developed a bold new mission and a vision for a world changed by those who experience God's love at camp. Camp Hanover's mission is to create inclusive community, inspire each other to live in God's love, and equip all people to live out God's call. Camp Hanover is a place apart, and at its inception, one could literally translate that being a place apart as being separated by vast distance. Camp was out in the sticks. Today, modern civilization is just a hop, skip, and a jump away. But being a place apart isn't about proximity or distance. Today, it's about, just as it was in 1957, being a place where things are different. In a world filled with divisiveness and hatred, camp is a place where things are different. Where you get to be the person God created you to be. Where you get to know, really know your neighbor as God created them to be, and not by what society tells us about who they are because of where they're from or their economic station or the color of their skin or who they love. Camp is a place where all are welcome and are all the body of Christ. Living in Christ-centered community isn't a passive activity. Each member is accountable to each other. We have a responsibility and a role to play. As we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our Lord, we inspire each other to live more fully into the people God created us to be. It's not easy, and that's why camp is a place to practice. Practice being loved by God. Practice loving your neighbor. Practice caring for the earth and all of its critters. Practice standing up for the one who is vulnerable, the stranger, the one who has no voice or is the other, so that they will no longer be the other. Practicing these things here at camp make it easier to do when it counts out in the world outside of camp. Scripture tells us out of, generos out of the generosity of Christ, each of us is given their own gift. Jesus handed out gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, and pastor teacher to train Christ's followers in skilled servant work, working within, the Christ, within Christ's body, the church, until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other. At camp, we seek to give people the tools and skills they will need to go out into the world and serve, whether their personal mystery is ministry is as a pastor or parent, a welder or hospital worker, a teacher or a bus driver, whichever unique way God has called them individually. The board of directors has made this Camp Hanover's mission because if we achieve it, we believe those who are transformed by, God's, by God through their experience at camp can change things and bring healing and light into a broken world. Success in this mission brings us closer to our vision, that of a world where all people know God's love and embrace beloved community. There are four strategic goals we hope to accomplish over the next three to five years, and the work in pursuit of these goals has already begun to bear fruit. The first goal is to create a year-round invitation by expanding our faith-based programs adding youth and children's programming, creating energetic relationships with congregations both within the POJ and around the state, providing more respite moments for alumni and parents and adults, and offering training and equipping opportunities for older youth and adults. The second goal is to develop a deeper engagement with the secular community by expanding our outreach within the local area, area schools, and non-church affiliated participants, elevating creation care through environmental stewardship and education programs like Camp Tomato and the Chase after school program. 
Our third goal is to offer transformational experiences to more people. To do this, we'll need to identify the barriers that some campers or participants face that prevents them from fully experiencing camp experiences. We'll seek to enhance the camp experience so radical hospitality, welcome, and inclusion can be extended to all. Overcoming these barriers will be a challenge, and it's one we're eager to tackle and partner with you and the congregations of the Presbytery of the James. Our fourth goal, we will seek to invest in the stewardship of our physical and human resources so that we can achieve support and sustain the three goals that were previously outlined. Updating facilities and investing in the training and equipping of staff and board members, leveraging our connections and our story to drive growth of this ministry. This summer marks the 65th anniversary of Camp Hanover. And our hope is in achieving this goal that this place apart will be around for another 65 years. Speaking of 65 years, you are all invited to celebrate and give thanks to God for 65 years of this wonderful camp ministry. Please join us for homecoming over Labor Day weekend. Stay overnight from September 2nd through the 4th and enjoy all that Camp Hanover has to offer. Or join us just for the day or evening on Saturday, September 3rd, and get a taste of camp and a slice of birthday cake that evening. I would ask that uh, as I close, uh, you pray for the camp, the staff, and the campers who will be arriving here on Sunday for the first day of summer camp. If you know any young people who are looking for summer jobs, we can still put some folks to work, have them get in touch with us. Thank you, moderator. That concludes our report. Thank you, Doug. I now recognize Interim General Presbyter and Stated Clerk Fred Holbrook for a special presentation. Thank you, moderator. There is a proclamation of Thanksgiving that we want to make sure is recorded in the minutes of this meeting. The proclamation of Thanksgiving for the Ministry of Associate for Stewardship, Deborah L. Rex Road. In 2 Corinthians 9, the Apostle Paul writes, each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul continues, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. When we think of generosity and cheerfulness, we think of Deborah. Dr. Deborah L. Rexrow joined the staff of the Presbytery in November 2015 and served faithfully for six years as associate for stewardship. We celebrated that earlier in the meeting, but we want to make sure this is recorded in the minutes. Her research and doctoral dissertation focused on stewardship and the role of clergy in providing strong financial leadership in their congregations. Deborah brought to the Presbytery a background of research, study, and application of the theological understanding of stewardship and the importance of ongoing stewardship education in our congregations. With passion and commitment, she provided consultation to pastors, sessions, and stewardship committees with stewardship campaigns, capital campaigns, and planned giving. Deborah is one of those ruling elders who epitomizes praying for and serving the people of God with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. Deborah has significant experience in both small and large congregations as a leader in finance, stewardship, worship, Christian education, and congregational care. She helped organize a Christian education purpose group for the Presbytery and served as a commissioner to the 222nd General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA in 2016. Deborah's love for Camp Hanover was accentuated by her serving as moderator of its purpose group, as well as its director of development. 
She provided stewardship and fundraising guidance, resources, and awareness for numerous ministries of the presbytery. So we give thanks that when she was asked to form a presbytery stewardship committee and establish a network of stewardship contacts for each congregation, Deborah said yes. When asked to provide an annual stewardship training conference for the presbytery, Deborah said yes, and she expanded it to include the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America congregations in our region. When asked to teach or preach, Deborah said yes, visiting a vast majority of the Presbytery's congregations, creating a culture of generosity and hope. When the pandemic struck, Deborah said a quiet yes and contacted nearly every pastor and congregation to see how she might be of assistance as they navigated, navigated financial concerns such as budgets, online giving, and the CARES Act. When God asks, Deborah Rexrode says yes. So we, the Presbytery of the James, boldly proclaim our thanksgiving for Deborah Rexrode for her ministry, her passion, her faith, her hope, and her love. With deepest gratitude, signed moderator Dan J. Jordanger, Presbytery of the James. Thank you, Fred. Oh, you, <clears throat> Kenna Payne has asked for a moment of personal privilege. So before, before we close, yes, I'm going to hand the microphone to her. There is no doubt in my mind he did not expect this, but Fred, would you join me up here, please? We have a standing ovation going on in here. I hope you're doing so at home on the Zoom feed. Moderator, thank you for this opportunity. Um, Fred, I'd like you, I'd like to think that everybody in attendance today is aware of the significance of this meeting. And just in case you're a guest, let me point out that today's meeting is the last meeting of the Presbytery of the James at which Fred serves as interim general presbyter, stated clerk, parliamentarian, head of staff, and secretary treasurer of the corporation. He joins the ranks of retired people on July 1st. On that date, he celebrates 40 years of ordained service to the Lord and to the PCUSA. His MDiv degree is from Union Presbytery here in Richmond. His pastoral calls have taken him to North Carolina, Virginia, Kansas, and included 12 years as the executive director of the Massanetta Springs Camping Conference Center. I am sure we will all agree that it's, we are bl blessed that he is retiring within the bounds of this presbytery. So eventually we'll get to see him again, I hope. I've been asked to make a presentation and a statement from the Synod of the Mid-Atlantic. Fred, the Synod of the Mid-Atlantic is 14 presbyteries, 1,300 churches, and 215,000 members honor you as you make the transition from active full-time ministry to retirement. Strong congregations make for strong presbyteries, and strong presbyteries make for strong synods. Your service in the region has been exemplary within the region and across the church. On behalf of the synod moderator, Stephen Scott, the Vice Moderator, Addie Peterson, the Synod Executive Committee and its commissioners, well done. May the music of your noted bagpipes con continue to bellow in the rhythm of retirement. <laughs> this gift, this is from the Synod, represents a token of our love and appreciation for your service from your friends and colleagues from the Synod of the Mid-Atlantic, Warren Lassane, Executive and Stated Clerk. Okay. Now, on behalf of the Presbytery and the Mission Council, I do want to express our appreciation to and for you. The Presbytery of the James has been fortunate, fortunate to have enjoyed and experienced the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook as interim general presbyter and stated clerk during the last three years. 
Dr. Holbrook has extended, exhibited solid leadership, sincerity, honesty, integrity, sensitivity, and exceptional knowledge of the Book of Order. His willingness to provide a listening ear, excellent responses, and pastoral care have brought the Presbytery of the James through a transitional period that has resulted in our readiness for the incoming lead presbyter for vision and collaboration. Amen. We are, we are excited for Dr. Holbrook and his family as he prepares for retirement and spending time with his beloved Laura and their family. Fred, we will miss you. However, you will be remembered and you will always be loved. Thank you for all you have done for the Presbytery. Your healthy pastoral style has allayed the anxiety that could have created difficulty in this transition period. Your commitment to justice and equity has created opportunities for continued growth and progress. We know that God will continue to guide, direct, and bless your life. May the love of God, the promise of constant presence of the Holy Spirit, and the redeeming love of Jesus Christ remain with you for all eternity. Thank you for everything you have done in the Presbytery and for all you do and have done for the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. Now, we cannot let Fred go without some kind of gift to show our appreciation. So we have two things for him. One, it, we have written a resolution that will be printed and framed as he may want. And it says, resolution and statement of appreciation to the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook. Inasmuch as the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook has led and served the Presbytery of the James as the interim executive presbyter and stated clerk for three years, leading the Presbytery in its transition to new leadership, inasmuch as the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook has provided sound interpretation of scripture, has encouraged a spiritual atmosphere throughout the Presbytery, and has been a pastor to pastors, commissioned pastors, and Christian educators, Inasmuch as the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook has been a model for executive leadership and administration and has interpreted the Book of Order with accuracy and creativity, inasmuch as the, Fred, the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook is a pastor, executive, brother in Christ, a lover of the Church of Jesus Christ, and a faithful servant of God, be it resolved that on this day, June 14th, 2022, the Presbytery of the James declares that it will always love, respect, and value Fred's leadership. The Presbytery of the James will remember all that Fred has preached, taught, modeled, and lived in his faithful walk with God in Christ Jesus. The Presbytery of the James will miss Fred, will pray for him and his family, and will hold all that he has taught, lived, and modeled dear to our hearts. We affirm that the Reverend Dr. Fred Holbrook retires in good standing, in love and in faithful life in Christ, and that he has provided sound, healthy, and progressive leadership and service to congregations, councils, and organizations within the Presbytery, and we thank God for bringing him to us. We will always give thanks to God for Fred and for his presence in this Presbytery. And it will be dated today, and it will be signed by me as the moderator of the Mission Council and by Dan as the moderator of the Presbytery. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we want to ask that the second gifts come from the churches and people in the Presbytery. We ask that you forward individual messages of thanks and good wishes to Fred in one of two ways. First, mailed notes are always wonderful to receive, and they can be sent to Fred at the Presbytery's office address. Alternately, a page has been created on the Presbytery's website where you can write and sign a message to Fred, and it will be electronically forwarded to him. That page will be available through July 5th. So Fred, we love you, we thank you, and we praise God for sending you to us. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Did you want to say anything?
I just want to give thanks to God for the opportunity that I've had to serve with you. It has truly been a joy. It has been a calling and a culmination of my ministry, and I'm so grateful for this. One of the passages that has always been a strength to me is from Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that a lot of people have favorite verses, but that is one that always resonates for me. So thank you for putting up with my corniness, sometimes in intense moments where I did something wacky and Dana was going, where did he get that from? It's just a blessing to know that the joy of the Lord is indeed our strength and our prayers are with the Presbytery, the James, as you do your work. My coach said, don't go anywhere near the Presbytery for a year. And so I will not be in attendance at Presbytery meetings for the next year. And that seems really foreign to me, but it is the right thing to do. And I give you thanks uh, for your trust that you placed in me. And I give thanks to God for the opportunity to serve. Thank you. God bless you, Fred. Um, before closing, I wish to thank the members and staff of Westminster Church in Richmond for hosting today's meeting. Thanks also to the team of teaching elders, ruling elders, and Presbytery staff who work diligently and prayerfully to prepare for and to carry out today's meeting. And I praise God for everyone who has attended and participated in the meeting. Before closing, I ask God's blessing for everyone celebrating Pride Month, Juneteenth, or both this month. And having completed our agreed upon business, I declare that this 111th stated meeting of the Presbytery of the James is adjourned, and I ask you to join me in prayer. Loving God, thank you for calling us to community and to service in your name. Thank you for leading each one of us to this Presbytery and to the work that you have called us to do. As we part from one another today, Help us to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, our God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are adjourned.